Our first guest speaker is a museum researcher, too, from the Archaeology Division of the National Museum of the Philippines. He graduated from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines with a bachelor's degree in history. He is currently pursuing his master's degree in anthropology at the University of the Philippines, Telemann. Currently, he is involved in the restoration of the Archdiocese and Shrine of Our Lady of Kaisasay in Taal, Batangas. He is also the researcher in charge of the Robert Bradford Fox National Archaeological Repository of the National Museum of the Philippines. He is the first person who had the Ames Museo Maritimo when it was founded in 2012. Today, he will present a presentation titled Maritime Narratives Through Museo Maritimo and Archaeological Evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor to introduce Mr. Greg Alfonso G. Abba. Let's give him a big round of applause. Hello. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, say Maritimo, Asian history of Maritime Studies, for having me here. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's uh, more than five years ago. Former, former colleagues. Museum. So my um, presentation is about, or my, the title of my presentation, Maritime Narrative, a Maritime Archaeological Evidence. So it's a two-part uh, presentation. The first part, uh, I will uh, discuss about the first two years of the uh, museum. And then the latter part, I'll be discussing some of the archaeological evidence that we have in the Philippines that uh, I think you're already familiar with because uh, Shao already uh, mentioned some of the archaeological objects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So this. Uh, the creation of Museo Maritimo, so the museum is a collaboration between the Asian Institute of Maritime Studies and then the Hinaraya Cultural Heritage uh, and Development Foundation. So the aim is represented by Dr. Abid Badaranga and then the Hinaraya represented by you know, the late Mr. Biden. So the project was launched on March 23, 2020 at the Philippine uh, Trade and Trading Center. Um, during that time, I was not yet a part of the team because I uh, entered uh, the museum in August 2012. So the project was already, uh, or uh, began already when I entered the museum. And now uh, uh, latter stage of the uh, project. So it was open to the public on October 11, 10, uh, 2012. Why that day? Because uh, uh, I remember Dr. Elena Pipadaranga uh, mentioned that if you uh, use the uh, numbers on the 10, 11, 12, why at the opening museum. So in the photo, we can see uh, Dr. Mina Tigabor. So, former secretary of uh, the Department of Tourism, founder, of, founder and president of the International School of Sustainable Tourism. And um, the lower photo features the uh, construction phase of the museum. So, there, um, it's been a part there, uh, led the meeting along with uh, other uh, persons of the project. So, here we have. Uh, Former Executive Director at the Museum Maritimo and uh, Ames, and then Mr. Sita Padulaya, and then uh, among others. Next slide, please. So, the Museum Maritimo is under the special project office. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, the SPO is uh, still existing today. But um, 
And then the special projects office is directed by the office director. So um, the personnel involved in the team during that time work uh, directly uh, with uh, with Dr. Ayan as the uh, president and uh, overall uh, head of the project. So here you can see a list of um, different uh, persons who became part of the uh, Between 2012 and 2014. Uh, I'm not the first uh, personnel when I uh, came here. So, uh, this was the second Taken is the first person to buy the team. And then, under Dr. Linda, you have Maritimo. Then it the team expanded. So we have Angela Bautista as our uh, graphics designer. And then Joel Hapai from one of the museum guys. Then of course uh, key persons were added like uh, Vera. Later became part of the team when I decided to uh, pursue an academic career uh, in doing for this. Then we also have student assistants. So student assistants, these are scholars of the study. So as part of their um, responsibility as scholars, so they were delegated student to help and maintain the meetings and of course other um, events and activities that uh, we would later uh, uh, create. So here we have also of us during the gathering, when we gathering and then uh, fundraising project main Okay, so the Hinaraya Cultural Heritage and Development Foundation Incorporated. Um, there are three persons, or four actually, that uh, represent the organization. So you have the late Dina Barton, former chair of uh, ICOM Philippines and uh, former president of the Hinaraya. You have um, Teresita Pagulayan, we call her Tess. Former creator of NHCP Museum of Heritage in Santiago. Uh, also a board member of the ICON Philippines. And then April Sumaido, uh, one, she's one of the uh, key persons from Inaraya that uh, became heavily involved in constructing and conceptualizing the museum. And then Mr. Ray Santiago, Mr. Ray Santiago is not actually. Uh, in Araya, but he, he was a retired archaeologist in Philippines. They have his expertise to build the Maritime Museum because the Ray Santiago, if uh, some of you are not familiar, is one of the respected uh, uh, pioneer archaeologists in Philippines. In the photo, uh, top photo, you can see his Pina Barte, uh, Dr. Aline Kapit Padaranga, and Tess Pagulayan. Um, Having a meeting uh, before the museum was constructed. So that's in the background, that's the original uh, uh, picture or uh, face. And then the middle photo, uh, that's during the event. So in the background is the Manungul Jar. So April Samailo is the one uh, on the left. Then bottom, uh, bottom uh, image, uh, you have some of the visitors uh, inspecting Ray Santiago's uh, uh, work, uh, the blue. Okay, uh, next slide, please.
Okay, so here, here are the mission, mission, and goals of the uh, Masaya Maritimo. So if you're starting museum, of course, you should start uh, mission so that you can guide you uh, regarding the direction of your uh, museum. So here, the North Star of Philippine Maritime History as uh, Masaya Maritimo uh, aims to be one of the leading Maritime related objects in the city, uh, which I hope someday would uh, materialize. And then, uh, mission, of course, to honor the maritime heritage, heritage of our nation by uh, serving as a repository and platform for uh, material, culture, and rich uh, maritime heritage in the country. Uh, for the goals, of course, in the gist, of course, um, to make seafaring uh, known to the public as a uh, reputable uh, course and profession uh, in the modern sense of our context. So, the one that we can see, the image that we can see during the museum, because it's not, uh, if you notice, the museum is located. Uh, to the public. So that, that's one of the struggles uh, at that time. So we, they had people that type of information that people would not have now because it was open to the public. Now, next slide, please. So these are the key sections of the museum when I uh, when I arrived during the uh, initial construction. Uh, so I, uh, these are the sections that I placed, but I believe the Museo Maritimo now has uh, a different classification of the, how the objects or the sections are uh, labeled. So to me, I uh, categorized it as pre-colonial period, where, wherein you have your replicas of the Manungul Jar, um, stone tools, Kataya, or the local boats of the Ipatan, or fishing. Then you have the advent of the Spaniards, wherein um, objects like the replica of the Nau Victoria, of Magellan, sculpture of Enrique de Malaca, a map showing the Treaty of Tordesillas, the Treaty of Zaragoza, and a map of the Manila Portugal, just uh, located at the back. Then you have the modern contemporary period going here. So uh, this between or this um, flat uh, exhibit area here. So it features the pillars of the Philippine maritime industry, uh, interactive module, this one, uh, and then the Philippine Coast Guard and uh, light of light at sea. Um, some of the objects that you can see. Uh, were loaned from Mr. Antonio Araneta so, uh, from his personal collection. So, uh, some of the objects uh, featured in the uh, sections that I mentioned as part of Mr. Antonio Araneta's uh, personal collection. And then you have the historical timeline of the Philippine Maya history, so at, uh, at the back here. So I will show some of the images of the perception. Next slide, please. So there, um, at the front, uh, you can, uh, the statue of Father Blessed Rodrigo will welcome the visitors who allegedly uh, conducted the first mass in Philippines. So from there, at the entrance, uh, the visitors will go on their right side to have uh, a tour of the museum in the uh, on the clockwise uh, manner. And then you have the uh, statue of Enrique de Malaca, who is one of the central uh, figure of the museum because it highlights uh, Enrique as a uh, Southeast Asian who first circumnavigated the world, so not the uh, uh, 
the Western Indies. Then you have the replica of the now and Victoria, which was the only ship of Ferdinand Magellan to return to Spain during their circumnavigation. So, uh, next slide, please. So, this one during the initial construction of the museum is not part. So, Miss uh, Dr. Aileen Abid Badaranga and the team, uh, specifically he, uh, had some meetings before on how to add uh, museum modules or sections inside the museum to add depth to the narrative of the, uh, the museum. Because during the opening, uh, while it's visually appealing, the design of the museum, but if you're an academic or in history, uh, you will notice the uh, insufficient depth of some of the uh, modules of the museum. So here, I created uh, a map of the Philippines uh, featuring the traditional boats in the Philippines. So I modified the donated illustration of the uh, Ray Santiago of the National Museum of the Philippines uh, to create this map. And then I also added uh, the method and technique of construction of the Butuan boat in Palangay. So that the pre-colonial section of the museum can be uh, more uh, uh, in-depth. Okay, so next slide, please. So from the pre-colonial to the Spanish uh, period, now going to the modern or contemporary period of, uh, of my, the maritime industry. So here we have pillars of the maritime industry like Gregory Oka of Camuco, Benjamin Mata, uh, Vicente Aldenese, Vicente Madrigal, one of the uh, key figures in shipbuilding in the Philippines, Ambassador Carlos Salinas, uh, Tomas Loma, and Felix uh, Padilla among others. Uh, and then we have the interactive module for uh, kids, and as you can see in the photo, so that um, young visitors can appreciate the maritime museum. So of course, uh, since kids are not into history at a young age, so uh, playful. So this part was dedicated for our then and the, when they constructed the museum. Then life at sea module, of course, in this section, so that um, non-seafaring people or folks can appreciate uh, the nautical instruments that uh, modern seafarers are now uh, uh, learning in how, in how to use. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> then we have the Philippine Coast Guard. So this one is an addition to when I uh, became part of the museum so that uh, the PCG can be uh, highlighted as well in terms of their contribution uh, in the maritime industry and to complement the interactive module part of the uh, museum. Next slide, please. And then we have the historical timeline of the maritime industry. So later on, if you want to check this out, uh, since the we will start in this uh, panel, so major on uh, unique because instead of um, starting from the left side of the uh, section, we will start on the right side because it's uh, uh, the museum. Then we added also, this is also an addition, it's not part of the original construction of the museum. So I, uh, we added this to highlight some of the milestones of the Philippine uh, maritime history and industry, such as from the Spanish, from the pre-colonial to the uh, Spanish period, and then to the contemporary. So you have uh, some of the milestones here, like the Manila Galleons and the Filipino shipbuilders as part of uh, that history. Then establishment of the Philippine Merchant Academy in 1890, creation of the Bureau of Navigation in 1901, so American period. Uh, 
Greve de Marinos or Seafarers Guild Strike and Christmas Eve fiasco that will, will later on uh, affect the shaping of the Philippine maritime industry. Then later on, completion of the Port of Manila, and then the emergence of key Filipino figures in the maritime industry like Felix P. Padilla, uh, who founded uh, Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering Institute, and I'm Thomas Goma of the Philippine Maritime Institute. Um, other milestones also is the formalization of the profession as a seafarer, and of course, creation and improvement of law regarding uh, seafaring and uh, the maritime industry. Next slide, please. Okay, so other key sections of the Museo Maritimo, uh, Old Port of Manila, it's a diorama. Uh, through the assistance of Sir Ray Santiago was uh, created. So uh, we, the Museo Maritimo would like to highlight the importance of uh, Manila uh, during the pre-colonial and Spanish colonial period uh, in terms of the, as a commercial hub of uh, maritime transaction in the Philippines. Okay, we also added customs and tariffs in the ancient times and the development of games and PSTC. And then last is the uh, memorabilia section. Captain Willie Hadley, the founder, one of the founders of uh, Asian Institute of Studies and the father of Dr. Lina Pichadaranga. Okay. So uh, this is the left. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so left side, that's also an addition. So Customs and tariffs from the Asian time. Because when you say maritime industry, it's not just only about seafaring. So there's also the other half of the maritime industry, which is customs and tariffs. Uh, and then, uh, right photo, the development of AIMS and PSTC. Uh, AIMS is the uh, academic uh, institution, while PSTC were uh, products of the AIMS and, of course, other. Seafaring uh, schools can train and uh, hone their seafaring skills eventually, which will they need when they go on board a maritime vessel. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the last section is the memorabilia of uh, the founder of uh, AIMS, which is Captain Mikaji of Green. So just uh, a trivia, the one who created this uh, bronze bust is the same person who created the statue of uh, Lapu Lapu. Setting up the Ajit Imam. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay, so these are the activities and projects of uh, Museo Maritimo in the first two years. So we had planning sessions and museum visits to uh, We also uh, created the Kasai Saran, which is a uh, fundraising event uh, for the museum because it's a private museum. So we need to generate also funds to develop and maintain the museum. And then we had also a museological training at Angeles City, Pampanga in 2013. We also conducted an art exhibition, uh, a Tambobong art exhibit, exhibit, which is, uh, it featured Ernie Patricio, uh, who is a uh, native of Tambobong. Tambobong is now uh, Alabon. Okay. And then Captain Phillips uh, Special Sweeney uh, in 2013. So we invited uh, students in uh, the institution to, uh, to have a group, uh, a special screening of the film at that time. And then we also attended the IPOM Philippine International Museum Day Forum at De La Salle. And then, of course, uh, museum tours for the internal and external side of uh, AIDS. And then development. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's the 
uh, poster for the Kasay Saran, and then Captain Phillips, and then Kung Kadambo Bong Hai Kibi. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so here, upper left, is a group photo with visitors from UB uh, Visayas. And then on the upper right, uh, you can see Joel Hapai conducting uh, a tour of the museum. Lower left, uh, one of our planned sessions, so very informal, so not in his uh, table for just uh, having a casual meeting. Uh, in, uh, I think this one's in Batangas. And then uh, lower right, this one's one of our museum visits in Tubi, Zambales. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, of course, one of the, uh, two of the archaeological, replica of archaeological objects featured in the museum uh, are the Manunggul jar and uh, later on, the Palangay replica which is uh, created also by the late uh, Ray Santiago. So from this point, I'll be discussing some of the archaeological evidence excavated in the Philippines that uh, allow us to have a glimpse of uh, maritime narratives of the country. Okay. I'm not discussing anymore the Baton boat because if I'm not mistaken, this was already uh, Presented before by Dr. Gay Laxinius, who is uh, the authority on this uh, particular topic. Okay, next slide, please. So, what do archaeological evidence show or tell us in the Philippines maritime narrative? Uh, let's see. Next slide. <laughs> so, first one is the Manungo jar. Of course, the Manungo jar is an earthenware secondary rural jar considered as a national cultural treasure, NCT. So when you say an NCT, it means that the object has an outstanding historical, cultural, artistic, and scientific value. Okay? So this one is dated from the late Neolithic period or circa 890 to 790 before Common Era of BC. Um, this was excavated in 1964 in Manugul Cave, 1.0. Pleasant Palawan, but uh, as early as 1962, Robert Fox, one of the pioneer anthropologists in the Philippines, already started uh, the excavation or exploration of the uh, Taban Cave complex in Palawan. Um, this year, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the archaeological exploration of the Taban Cave complex. Uh, and then um, the jar has a height of 6 centimeters. 51.5 centimeters in maximum value yield. Okay. So when you say uh, earthenware secondary burial jar, it means that uh, the jar contains the bones of the jar. So after the uh, initial inhumation on the skeletal remains of the deceased, uh, is placed inside a secondary burial jar. Okay. Now, um, the jar itself has uh, an inside curvilinear motif. So it's like uh, a wave light okay, alluding to, of course, uh, water, then applied with hematite or red over inside the, uh, the area of the uh, curvilinear motif. And then it features a ship of the dead on the lead, which is uh, in an archaeological uh, context, so that's historical. Um, for archaeologists, it is one of the most um, uh, excellent display of craftsmanship of a late Neolithic culture in Southeast Asia. Because other than the Monon culture, we don't have uh, other artifacts that uh, have this similar uh, feature, the Ship of the Dead, that is uh, systematically excavated or found in the Philippines. Okay? So as you can see, uh, there are two figures in the aboard the ship or the boat, and uh, they have they are uh, uh, displayed with cross arms, and they have uh, bands around their head, which is a common mortuary practice in uh, the Philippines. Okay. So the spirit boat 
as you can see in the photo, has a carved crow and eye. Okay? So this uh, zoomorphic um, picture is also uh, can also be seen with the uh, sama of Sulu and then uh, Ibans in Malaysia, as pointed out by Dr. Dutton in one of his publications. And then the, the boatman located at the back okay, is represented as steering the ship, so not paddling. Okay, so uh, he's guiding the soul of the dead to the afterlife. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so this is the Tabon Cave complex in uh, Quezon, Palawan. It's a limestone formation. Okay. So it was uh, explored and investigated by the National Museum of the Philippines uh, from 1962 to 1966. And currently, there are um, 29 caves identified uh, in the Taban Cave complex, but only 16 were excavated. Okay. So the systematic excavation of the Taban Cave complex uh, revealed archaeological deposits that uh, span at least 50,000 years. Uh, Okay. And then, of course, yielding the oldest evidence of human habitation uh, in the Philippines, the uh, Taban Mine. So, radiocarbon dates and comparative examination of sites and artifact, artifacts set the chronology of the Jarboreal tradition in the Taban Cave complex between 890 BC to around 300. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, some of the uh, images and some of the caves that can be found in the Taban Cave Complex and excavated by the National Museum of the Philippines in the 90s. So you have the Taban Cave. And then the other three images, you can see the uh, in situ artifacts when the archaeologists archaeology arrived in this cave. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is, uh, these are an artist's illustration of uh, how burial jars are placed inside uh, a burial cave, and then how uh, early Filipinos okay, uh, are manufacturing this kind of earthenware vessels. So this uh, artist illustrations were from the Filipino heritage. A nation volume one. Okay, next slide, please. So now we have the Banton uh, boat shaped coffins from uh, Romblon. So these coffins were collected or uh, systematically retrieved in the Guyangan cave system, Banton Romblon. So the Guyangan cave system is an important cultural property, but unlike the Tabu cave complex, not uh, yet. Uh, well explored uh, up until now. So there's still a lot of unidentified caves that possibly uh, contain archaeological materials uh, like uh, wooden coffins and ceramics that can be helpful in um, adding, um, adding depth to the maritime or archaeological uh, history of the Philippines. Okay. So these are secondary burial wooden coffins meaning only the bones of the place, and dated 13th to 14th century CE. So the archaeological investigations of uh, the Banton uh, coffins coincided with the exploration of the Taban Cave in the 1960s. So the Banton coffins are uh, created through hollowed out pieces of wooden logs. So there's a uh, one log and then you split that in two. Okay, and then you carve the interior. So um, the boat shaped coffin has a triangular lid, as we can see. And then what makes it uh, unique is that it features motifs of uh, reptiles such as uh, snake, lizard, or crocodile. So the banton, or the boat coffins in general, can be uh, found in burial caves or rock shelters. Okay. So the National Museum in the 1960s uh, systematically retrieved a total of 14 uh, 
but uh, both coffins. Okay. And then these have associated uh, grave goods of um, ornaments, vinyl and glass beads, um, 13th to 14th century Chinese ceramics, and of course, it contains uh, human bones with uh, modified skulls. So if maybe you're interested, interested on what uh, the type of food that they are that they really used during this time, uh, that time, uh, it's uh, mulawi, vitex parviflora. But of course, uh, both coffins of other uh, regions in the Philippines have uh, different foods. So it depends on the availability of a particular group in a particular province. Okay. Next slide, please. So the boat coffin, the existence of boat coffin burials in the Philippines uh, as early as the late 19th century when uh, foreign explorers visited the country. Okay. So uh, this tradition is evident in different parts of the Philippines, like Bohol, Reluque, Masbate, Romblon, Palawan, Panay, Negros. So what um, this uh, burial tradition uh, signify in terms of our uh, worldview of the early Philippines. So it um, reveals the inhabitants' social status and worldview, particularly on creation, death, and afterlife, wherein the coffin serving as a vessel, uh, both towards the metaphysical realm and the belief of on Tambal uh, Ahas, Sikmin, Malagad, um, Bakunawa, and others. Okay. So the boat coffin burial complex and tradition in the Philippines uh, highlights the centrality of, of the boat okay, as, uh, as a mediator of the world of the living, world of the dead, of the afterlife. And impl it implies the soul's faithful voyage to my passage. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So, this is the in situ uh, location of the boat coffins when the National Museum of the Philippines explored the Guayang Cave system. So, this is specifically uh, found uh, in the Guayang Cave uh, tree. Okay. So, a total of 12 were collected. In that particular cave. But on the other cave, Yang Cave 1, uh, they were able to receive two more coffins, so a total of 14. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, these are two of the Banton boat coffins that are now part of the National Museum of the Philippines. So this one is a secondary burial coffin with reptilian feet. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, okay, so these are the two, two of the 14 boat coffins that are now in the collection of the National Museum. So the top coffin features a reptilian motif, and then the lower coffin, uh, geometric uh, motif. So the upper one, um, it has a length of 120 centimeters for the uh, cover, so more than a meter. While the lower coffin um, I think uh, so more, more than 8 centimeters. So next slide please. Okay, so Inside of the Banton boat coffin, when the NMT retrieved it, or human remains with uh, modified uh, skulls. Okay? So, this practice by the very inhabitants of Banton Island from Don uh, is being done when the uh, human is still young, okay? when the parts of the skull is not. 
six. Now, uh, 35 trillion yen, okay, were recovered by the Dutch Museum in 1961 and 1966. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So, next is the boat shaped of the Dutch Islands. Okay, so this boat shaped uh, 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 burial marker very unique also in the Philippines, okay? So this burials were first encountered in 1994 by the National Museum. Then due to its uh, uh, unique uh, feature, the National Museum decided to explore this and uh, uh, formed the Batanes Archaeological Project in 1994 headed by Dr. Dijon, okay? So these are located in the islands of Tabtang, Ibujos, uh, Ibayat, and uh, Batan. Later on, I'll show an image of the locations. So the boat shaped burials are markers arranged intentionally to resemble the Tataya or Faloa. So these are the local boats of uh, the Ibatan. So some of the markers were simply uh, laid out flat, but some markers are uh, piled, with, piled heavily with stones. To resemble an overturned boat. So, when nakatao na uh, bangka. And then, lengths ranging from 4 to 8 meters. So, malaki. Okay. Then, widths ranging from 1.5 to 3 meters. Okay. So, um, geologists from the National Museum uh, identified the type of stones. Uh, used in creating these burial markers, which is limestone and andesite stone bubbles. Okay. Some of the excavated burials yielded human skeleton remains with associated ceramics, shells, and bay corals. So far, there are 39 identified um, boat shaped burial markers in the islands of uh, Batanes. So, what does it tell? Uh, it suggests that burials suggest a Baranian. Culture in the Philippines, which dates back to about 300 to 400 years old. Okay. Um, aside from this boat uh, shaped burial markers, there were also uh, round and square uh, markers um, found okay, in close proximity with these burial markers. So, when the, some of these round or square markers were excavated by the end. So there, there, there are no uh, skeletal remains found, but some of the stone markers in the shape of a uh, round or square were uh, uh, yielded uh, uh, at the uh, Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the locations of the uh, stone uh, boat ship burials in Batanes. So that's the Itbayat Island, Batan, the lower part. And then uh, adjacent to it is the islands of Sabtang and Ibujos. Okay. And the right image is the distribution of some of the boat ship burials found in uh, Chohangin site in Ibujos Island in uh, Batanes. Okay. So, uh, the Chohangin coastal site in Ibos Island, Batanes, uh, is a habitation site as well as a burial site. Okay. So, many uh, early inhabitants of uh, uh, Batanes also resided in that place. And uh, along with that place, is, of course, they established a um, burial site for their uh, deceased. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is an, uh, an image of the Tuhangin coastal site uh, wherein uh, boat shaped burials were found in the Bohus Island. Okay, so you have the number one, you have the Tuhangin Ijam. Okay, it's a fortified uh, hill settlement in uh, Batanes. So that's, one, that's a unique feature also of the island. And then number two, you have the Chohangin Stone Boat Shaped Burial Site 1. 
then followed by number three of to hang in stone boat shaped burial site. And then number four, there's also burial site there in Mahayao, uh, beach beach burial site. Okay. So radio, uh, radiocarbon reporting test of some of the human skeleton found in Johanna uh, revealed one, one juvenile, uh, one burial site uh, revealed a juvenile uh, skeletal remain. And then this was radiocarbon dated to 100 years old. And then since some of the NMP ideologists uh, uh, wanted to make sure the age of the first the age of the uh, of uh, this boat shape for your uh, wave marker. So a year later, they also uh, dated another for in Johanni, which revealed the date of 300 to 400 years old. So uh, the for site in Johanni um, yielded a culture of. Um, uh, burying the dead from between the 16th century up to the uh, early 20th century. So aside from um, burial remains at the Chuhangin uh, site in Bose Island, uh, they also excavated uh, stone tools and earthen shirts uh, supporting that uh, the Chuhangin coastal site was not just a burial site, but also a habitation site by early uh, inhabitants of, uh, of the island. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is uh, the juvenile uh, uh, remains of uh, one of the burial, some coastal burial in the Chuhangin site. Okay. So the boat shape boil marker measured uh, about two meters in length and one meter uh, in width. So just over 100 years old. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are uh, images of uh, other um, boat shape uh, boils to hang in. So on the left photo, this one is a, uh, a rescue archaeology because the uh, burial jar was already exposed. And the uh, team explored the area. And then this one, uh, they began the systematic uh, excavation of one of the burial. Uh, in this case, it uh, yielded an earthenware bowl and the brain coral served as the uh, marker of the uh, this is okay. So the excavation revealed a uh, uh, a human remain with in a flex orbital position. Okay, okay. And then the cranium is oriented in a north thirty direction, meaning the head is on the north, and then the feet towards. So, then the, uh, the person was uh, lying on his left, meaning facing the uh, east towards the sun. Okay. Sunrise. Okay. So the excavated human skeletal remain here is uh, estimated to be 50 years old. And then um, they reached the main burial pit okay, of, the, of the deceased at around 50 centimeters. So half a meter yung lalim yung nung nahuha yung remain yung tao. Okay. And then the bedrock was reached at a depth of 89 to 90 feet. Yung pinakasagad part yung korea. Okay. Next slide please. Okay, so aside from um, stone boat shaped burial uh, markers with uh, excavated human skeletal remains directly uh, buried under the soil, so there is also a burial jar tradition in Batanes, and as well as a mixture of the stone boat shaped burial and uh, 
stone bowl shaped marker and uh, a burial jar placed inside the stone marker. Okay, so this one, uh, this is a cover retrieved systematically excavated, now uh, displayed at the Palayok the Ceramic Heritage of the Philippines at the National Museum of Ecology. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, actually, patapos na. Okay. Uh, so this one in Nakamaya, uh, the lower right. So this is in Patan Island in Pasco. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to excavate human remains from uh, uh, the stone markers they explored. And then as you can see here, there's a square both marker uh, picture. So, and then this one around that part of the boat shape marker. So, ethnographic parallelism of uh, uh, NMPT during that time is that possibly uh, the square shape picture beside the boat shape is the sail, and then this one is uh, the rudder. Or the, the, Rear part of the boat. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So last, but but one boat coffin burial. So unlike uh, Manungbul, uh, Banton wooden coffin, and those two. Okay, this one is a primary burial, okay. uh, meaning that uh, it's a primary animation. They directly the debate ng tao. Uh, coffins. Uh, initially discovered in 1976 at City of um, Ambangan in Butuan City. Okay. Uh, in 1977, the National Museum conducted the rescue archaeology so that uh, these coffins can be retrieved and documented because when it was found, um, this was accidentally excavated during a, uh, uh, a flood control water program. So, they were digging for a canal, and then they accidentally uh, discovered this uh, coffin. So similar with Banton coffin, uh, this is hollowed out in street like fashion, and then contained human remains with modified skulls as well. Okay? So as you can note, uh, observe from the central part of the Philippines to the Mindanao part, the practice of the uh, uh, modified and then it has an associated grave goods of 14th to 15th century Chinese ceramics, a bronze bone, uh, a bamboo internal container, and gold ornaments. Okay. So a total of 12 coffins retrieved by the National Museum. And then uh, a, a, a total of 13 human skeletal remains, wherein 10 individuals, other individuals, have cranial modification. Uh, as well as the eight one skull, and then only one uh, human skull uh, is uh, normal. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the site where the coffin burials were discovered. So it's very near to the excavated squares where the Butuan boat were uh, discovered. So next slide, please. So you have uh, three types, large, medium, and small coffins, okay? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the unique features of the Bataan Royal Coffins is the floated cover. Okay? cover So um, according to the old Bataanans interviewed by the uh, National Museum, um, it uh, signifies the social status of the deceased. So you have those vados. Uh, the, the floated cover design is called vados, meaning shallow part of a river, the group part. Okay. So there's those vados, what the vados is vados. Okay. So the higher the number of groups, it means that the deceased has a higher social status. Okay. But uh, so you uh, the six vados are having six groups, 
very rare. Okay? And then when the coffins were found, it has a north-south orientation, wherein um, the deceased is uh, facing towards the sea. Okay? So in, in Butuan, called Butuan, called that um, Balawod, okay? it means um, towards the open sea. Okay? And then unlike the adult coffins, uh, the infant coffin has a different style, like a semi uh, pyramid uh, cover. Okay. So it has been suggested that the both coffins in the orientation facing the sea are part of a burial tradition developed by the riverine and maritime peoples of Southeast Asia who believe in boats as vessels burying the souls of the dead to the afterlife. Okay. Dos Bados, Cuatro Bados, and then Seis Bados. Okay, so concluding notes. Um, young as it seems, it's a maritime thing in the museum. Ah, okay. Uh, must be an important institution by being a key stakeholder in opening and engaging uh, discussions of Philippine maritime history, vis-a-vis modern superior seamanship. Um, uh, the museum should feature a museum section or module that explores and mainstreams anthropological narratives, actually even interdisciplinary narratives on life at sea. And then continue the museum education facet to form forums and research in collaboration with allied individuals and institutions. Okay, next slide. Uh, a maritime influence for oriented culture has been evident to artifacts and archaeological while similarities can be observed, such as the representation of the boat, um, technical difference were manifested on this material work that we saw earlier. Then part of this maritime culture is the centrality of water and water traps in shaping early Filipinos, uh, burial tradition, worldview, and socio-political organization. Um, the distribution of archaeological evidence from north to south, the archipelago, showing maritime narratives. So the theme of the forum is creating national maritime narrative. But um, as we saw earlier with archaeological evidence, well, there's probably national maritime narrative, but there are localized maritime narratives as evident by this archaeological object. Okay? So although localized, they are connected and indirectly or directly, which contributes to the uh, general maritime mar narrative of the country. Next slide. So there, thank you. Next slide for my reference. Thank you so much, Mr. Greg Alfonso G. Abba.